Stay tuned for Far East in the Modern World, a course offered by Seattle Central Community College. Learning has never been so easy. Get the best education firsthand. Next on Mind Extension University. Let me uh, pick up, somebody brought me this uh, little note, uh, I think from a magazine, um, that sort of starts us back uh, on the same theme. It's a quote from uh, John Adams, who once explained how the framers of the U.S. Constitution presupposed the necessity of God's grace for the survival of the new form of government. He said the following, quote, our Constitution was designed only for a moral and religious people, it is wholly inadequate for the government of any other. Because again, it goes back to the notion that these three sides have to be working. You've got to have culture and society working. You've got to have civic responsibility. You've got to have free markets in the pursuit of happiness in order to have limited, effective government. And as these three decay, the natural pressure of government will be to reach out and take over more and more. Now, it's going to lead us to some very interesting implications as we go through looking at the structure of government, which grows out of this cultural sense of a spiritual and moral society and a free society. First of all, remember, the Founding Fathers start with the notion that no human is perfect and none can be fully trusted with power. It's very important because, again, the modern cynicism expresses itself by saying either we stipulate that everybody is... Uh, so sinful that there's no point to worry about it, or if you're not that, then you must be a saint, so the minute we can find out that you're not, we can prove you're, that you're even worse than somebody who's sinful, because you're a hypocrite and sinful, and therefore nobody has any moral standing to say anything. Who are you to say that using drugs is bad? Or who are you to say that whatever the next? And you can find case after case of this argument for the inappropriateness of moral assertion. And yet the Founding Fathers knew that if everybody involved in a free society was human, that you had this really core problem. And they said it well in the Federalist Papers. The Founding Fathers understood the dilemma, and they said, quote, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. And yet, since men aren't angels, you need government in order to restrain the passions of men. But by definition, since the government's going to be made up of men, you're now giving the power to restrain to the people who you're trying to restrain. Lord Acton captured this in the middle of the 19th century when he said, quote, all power tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Notice the drop of the word tends. Now, this means that people say, well, you're now Speaker of the House. Are you talking about yourself? Of course. You, th you think if I had power forever, surrounded by people who wanted me to feel good, and so whatever I did, they said, oh, that's wonderful. Mud looks good on you, is the right response of a sycophant when you fall on your face on a rainy day. <laughs> and of course, all power tends to corrupt. And therefore, everybody is susceptible to it. Every person in this room is susceptible to it. Now, the Founding Fathers, faced with that, said, and, and this is one of the great works of genius in human history. They said, all right, if in order to be free, we have to give power to the very people we fear, ourselves. How do we structure it so we don't just create a new tyranny? And this was their answer. The American Constitution, to avoid tyranny, they designed a machine so inefficient that no dictator could force it to work. This is a very conscious design. And, and you're going to see it happen with the contract, because it's going to leave the house which is designed to be fast. Somebody once said, as a quote I saw this week that I thought was a reminder, one of the founding fathers had described, he said, the house is like a cup of hot coffee and the Senate is designed to be the cooling saucer that you pour the coffee. So when you see the Senate go slower, every one of the founding fathers would have said yes. And then when you see the bills go down to the president who may veto them, and that is his right, the founding fathers would have said yes. And then when the bill's finally passed, it can be taken to the Supreme Court to see whether or not it's constitutional. The founding fathers would have said yes. And everybody gripes about it until you get to something like health reform, where a year ago people didn't want it to pass. And guess what? 
the American Constitution worked. If we had been a European parliamentary system, we would have passed health reform like that. But in the American system, where an idea gets beaten up at every stage, and you better have a really powerful idea, and you better have a lot of people prepared to spend a long time to get it through. And that's not bad if your greatest value is freedom. It's terrible if your greatest value is efficiency. For efficiency's sake, get a good dictator. For, for freedom safe, you've got to start with, with two notions. One is, and, and let, me, let me walk one more step, because the corollary of stopping the dictator is that the American system disperses power so thoroughly we can barely make it work when we want to. Now, you'd better approach all this with a good sense of humor. You better say, well, I guess we're going to get messed up today again. And instead of seeing that as cynical, it's the price of freedom. And you've got to respect that you may have a good idea, but somebody else does too. And the price of freedom is frustration. I have, I have two phrases I try to teach people. Life is hard. Freedom is frustrating. So when you get up and you say to me, boy, life is really hard, the answer is yes. Next question. That's the thing we don't teach the poor. Life is hard. You want to succeed? You got to work. If you're poor, you got to work harder than people who aren't poor, by definition. And by the way, when you start to succeed, you're still going to be frustrated. As long as you're free. I mean, Ross Perot is a billionaire, and he's frustrated too. Because there are 260 million of us. And each one of us is endowed by God with certain unalienable rights. So every time you think you've got the right answer, you now got to convince everybody else. And we don't teach, I, I don't believe we teach correctly, just how hard and how frustrating and how difficult a free society is. And so it's a little bit like thinking you can play pro football without exercising. We, we tell people, well, you're, you're a citizen, you have all these rights. Sure. But first, you have all these responsibilities. You have to work hard to be a citizen of a free society. And if you're not prepared to work hard, you're not going to keep your rights very long. And I believe that, that this frustration is at the heart of the permanent tension between direct democracy and Republican representation. It's a very important issue, and one you'll see come up in the, in the term limits debate, where, where I favor term limits. But there's still this very real tension. On the one hand, direct democracy says, OK, how do we feel this week? We all raise our hand. Let's rush off and do it. The concept of Republican representation, which is very clear in the Founding Fathers, is you hire somebody who you send to a central place. They study the issues. They, by definition, learn things you don't learn because you don't want to be, you sent them. You didn't send you. You want to be able to go live your life. They are then supposed to use their judgment to represent you in a republic which is very different than a direct democracy. The Founding Fathers are very clear about this. They feared the passion of the moment. They feared the idea that you could establish a dictatorship with a good demagogue in the right six weeks of campaigning. And they wanted to create very hard problems of getting through. Now, in that context, let me just say that, that I think uh, Daniel Yankolovich, who really developed this, talks about the difference between public opinion versus coming to public judgment. I found this to be one of the most helpful explanations of what I experienced. Public opinion is, you get a call this morning and say, what do you think about X? Public judgment is six or eight weeks from now when you've read about it for a while, you've talked to your neighbors, you've had a discussion at Sunday school, you've chatted about it over lunch, you've listened to somebody talk about it on the radio, and now you've formed an opinion. There is a you, I mean, I mean a judgment. There is an enormous difference between public opinion What's the snapshot this morning? And public judgment. What do people think after they've talked about it for a while? And fairly consistently, the judgment is more cautious and remarkably smart. And if you look over time at, at the wisdom of the American people, the system works. But it takes time. It takes six weeks to three months as a general principle for the country to talk to itself. 